How's it going, everybody? Andrew Zarian here, Wrestling Observer Live. We're here every day, Monday through Friday, 3 p.m. Eastern, 1 p.m. on Saturdays with Jim Valley, and Sundays, 6 p.m. It's 6 p.m. I think it is. Hold on, let me check. 606. We're here. It's with me, Andrew Zarian. Excited to be here today. I feel like trash. I'm just going to let you guys know. I got Matt Ryan joining me from Catalyst Wrestling. You had a big eye pay per view last week. Apparently, the house was awesome in Brooklyn. It was a lot of fun. I want to talk to him a little bit about that. Just a little bit, guys. Just a tiny bit. Heard he had a great show. He's going to be joining me, kind of carrying me through this show because I am had a fever all day, coughing. No, 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 I don't have the vid, though. I just got, if you're watching the video, I got, I just tested myself again for the eighth time. I'm fine here. But we got a full gear preview. Next week? I can't believe it. Will we see the Elite on that show? I think so. We'll see what happens. Built a War Game Survivor Series. Big show for them coming up also. I want to hear Matt's thoughts on UFC 281. I thought it was a pretty good show live from Madison Square Garden. The city was bumping yesterday. A lot of those guys, they were out partying all night long. And I want to find out what is going on for this Raw XXX. Uh, last week, we didn't get a chance to talk about this. But, you know, this is an interesting thing. I, I, I can never have imagined that they would have run this title in, uh, in, in, in the Vince McMahon era, modern Vince McMahon era. I mean, they did do a Great Balls of Fire pay-per-view, right? Maybe they could have done a Raw XXX. But whatever you do, do not, do not Google search that. Do not go on Twitter, and start typing up spoilers for Raw XXX. You're going to get something you don't want. Or maybe you do. I don't know. But we have a lot to talk about today, obviously. I, and I want to get your opinions. I want to make this a little interactive. Chat room. If you're in our chats, join us there. If you're listening on Sports Byline, very easily. Send me a tweet, at Andrew Zarian on Twitter. I want to find out what you're thinking about everything that's happening in pro wrestling. Because there's a whole lot going on. Wrestling Observer Live Sunday edition. I'm going to bring Matt Ryan in after this break. Stay tuned. Wrestling Observer Live Sunday edition here on Sports Byline. I'm Andrew Zarian. I'm joined by my tag partner today, Hi. Matt Ryan. What's going on, Matt? Nothing much, man. Exhausted after an amazing UFC 281. And we got a big week, a big month of professional wrestling ahead of us. Last week, I wasn't here because of Catalyst Wrestling. But excited to be back on the show. A lot of stuff to look forward to and a lot of stuff to look back on. Hey, great buzz about that show, by the way. Thank I got, I got hit up by a bunch of people saying, hey, Matt put on an awesome show. The guys did great. G really cool venue, too. So congratulations. Thank you. And uh, you can watch it coming soon on StreamCatalystWrestling.com. Wow, you got a streaming deal before EW did. Look at that. That's something. <laughs> Never thought I'd see the day for that. We got a lot going on in professional wrestling. I, I do want to talk about AEW a little bit. Uh, so I'm, I'm sure I'm going to get the messages on, on social media because I'm wearing an AEW sweater. Yeah. Wearing an Sell AEW. out. Uh-oh. Uh -oh. You can't do that. Catch it's cold in here, checks. guys. I'm sick. What do you want get, me to do? Cash in payroll. checks. I'm on the payroll. Listen, I have no problem with that. Uh, I, I, I do want to talk to you about this as, uh, you know, being a lifelong wrestling fan, right? Something about AEW that I that I very much enjoy are these random things that happen, like Jun Nakayama debuting on Rampage next week, quite possibly leading into a singles match against Eddie Kingston at the pay per view. Uh, you, listen, you and I both big All Japan fans, big New Japan fans. I I grew up as a you know that tape uh, tape trader generation of of consuming wrestling. So this is this is a pretty cool thing to see. Do you, I mean, where are the negatives here? There aren't any. Um, AEW has a Big Ten philosophy, and they're trying to create dream matches for the diehards who grew up on the DVDR boards, who utilize PWT, who are tape traders, and they're trying to introduce a new generation of fans, a new kind of audience to these legendary wrestlers, to different styles of wrestling. In in a perfect egalitarian situation, this raises all tides. You know, it's, you know, high ships to all that other stuff. Terrible metaphors. I'm very tired. But when it gets down to it, when you get into the muck and the mire, people are going to pick this apart because inherently at the end of the day, wrestling fans look for the negative. They don't look for the positive for the most part in terms of just trying to find things that they like and only that they like. It's very polarizing right now, but I think it's an awesome thing. There's a lot of great stuff 
on this card for full gear this Saturday night in Newark, just a few minutes away from the studio here. But when you look at the main event and you look at everything else, it does feel a very one-match heavy card. But that's not a bad thing because this is a match and a situation we've wanted to see probably since both of these guys debuted in AEW, and I'm talking about MJF and John Moxley. No, absolutely. I, 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 I would imagine there's more that's going to be added this week, uh, possibly with the Bucks and Kenny. But you know, this is your final pay per view of 2022, which was a a you know, it wasn't. I I would have imagined coming out of the the pandemic era and going into you know things are kind of moving now. You would have had an easier year, but they seem to have had you know number of problems. Uh, you know, between Cody leaving, obviously, uh, CM Punk's issue, you know, the Bucks uh, and Kenny uh, having to step away for this investigation. Kenny being out for most of 2022. I don't you know? think anybody would have looked on January 1st of this year and assumed we were going to end up where we are heading into the final pay-per-view of 2022. I think the outlook... As I don't think Tony thought this either. I don't think yeah, I, I don't think either. anybody did. Like there might be one podcaster or one person on the internet who was able to cornacky this and break it down exactly what was going to happen beat by beat by beat. But I don't think any of us who are pundits or work within the industry thought this was going to be the way things played out. A lot of different things broke bad or broke good for AEW this year. I think from June to September was a watershed time across the industry because of everything that went down with Vince McMahon, with a lot of the institutional changes that WWE made, and obviously all the stuff that happened between July and the end of All Out. Yeah, I, I, you know, I was trying to think where, where would it have gone? You know, where would, where would we have been if a lot of these things did not happen? Uh, I don't know. I don't know where WWE would have been right now. Uh, I don't know where AEW would have been right now. It's kind of hard to predict. I, I do think the benefit for AEW, WWE is the perception change that's happened over there. Not necessarily you're act actually seeing big major changes happen, but, uh, you know, somebody said this to me from there as like a like a half joke, and, and they said, it looks like we, we went backwards to 2018. That was the that's joke. That's not a bad, but that's, yeah, but that's kind of not a bad thing. It's not I a think bad 20 thing. Yeah, they just went backwards to 2018, and that that's what he was saying. And I'm thinking, I'm like, look at this roster, you know? Look at who you have back, and look at all the ideas you're trying again. You know, yeah, a little bit, possibly. You're in 2018. I think Adam Cole would have played a big part in that if, they, if, if Hunter could have had his way. But, you know, this is a very different year we're going into with AEW and WWE. It, it, it seems like, you know, the momentum is kind of split right now, and AEW is having to play a little bit of defense here. And that's not an untenable situation for AEW. I, I, I see a lot of people like AEW in the mud. Like, they're a company that's no, been not around at all. for less yeah, than that, three. That, they're, they're, they've been around for three years. The WWE has had the, the institutional structures that they've had for 40 years. That is a huge advantage. And this company is growing and learning in real time. And a lot of things that were good for the boys or the business structure ran into a lot of realities that just happened in a workplace. And I feel the idealism behind the, the start of AEW and a lot of why the fans in the initial run of AEW were so mad after all the stuff that happened this year, that's what happens in the entertainment industry. That's what happened in sports. Like you, the Dallas Cowboys in the 1990s had everything going for them, but their own, you know, the egos, hubris, drug addiction, Within the time period they're playing in, these things happen. These teams fall apart, and it's what you do after that that really defines you and really defines the dynasty that you're trying to establish. And I think AEW is going to take a lot of what they learned in 2022 and apply it to 2023 and be a better company for it 12 months from now. Yeah, I and I and I'm and I'm looking forward to that. I I, I think this is going to be a very interesting year for both companies. Like I said. Uh, you know, but look at all these signings now, right? They have they have AEW now has Soraya, formerly known as Paige. Bandito has officially signed. Uh, you know, the Bucks and Kenny are coming back. MJF may be world champion next week. 
You know, what, where do you go? What do you do? I think these are all great questions. And I think the same goes for WWE with, you know, but I don't think they have as much pressure on, on a pay-per-view th- than AEW would right now. Because AEW needs to knock this one out of the park for sure. And, and you know, this would be the first, first pay-per-view, post-pay-per-view, if nothing goes wrong, that they don't have some sort of travesty coming out of it. Between MJF, yeah. uh, you know, the issue with MJF and the issue now with Punk. It, you know, I'm glad to kind of get it out of the way, but they are going into a big show here in Newark, New Jersey. So we'll see what happens. But the Junakiyama, uh, Junakiyama stuff I'm psyched for. I, I think that's yeah. a very cool thing. It's going to be a great weekend of wrestling with a lot of great matches and Akiyama and potentially Akiyama versus Kingston on the pay-per-view is kind of a <laughs> a cherry on the Sunday for the weekend. But there's a lot of cool stuff coming up and awesome to finally have an AEW pay-per-view in our neck of the woods and not in Chicago or Jacksonville or anywhere. Your neck of the woods, not, not mine. Yeah. Not my neck it's of the, the woods. New York, it's the New York metropolitan Andrew area, Andrew. If we could say the, the UBS York, no, no, Arena no, 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 no. is a part it of the New not, York Comedy Festival. It is not, it is not, it is not part of the, the New York metropolitan Andrew <laughs> area. The New York Andrew, metropolitan Andrew... The New York metropolitan Andrew... There you go. There you go. Uh, that, that consists of like seven minutes here and seven minutes there. I'll go to the garden, 20 minutes. I'll go to Arthur Ashe, eight minutes. I'll go to UBS. I can get in my car. It's around, it's around the, the house. So the Bar- Barclays Center is your dividing line. No if you way, have to no go, way. If you have Forget to go on the BQE, if no. you have to get on the BQE or I-278, you're like, screw this. I'm not, I'm not Never. leaving the house. I'm not leaving the house. Andrew Resting the Diva Zarian. He'll eat a potato <laughs> on the subway, but he won't go to Brooklyn. <laughs> Wrestling Observer Live. We'll be back right after this. Stay tuned. Observer Live. <laughs> Sunday edition. I'm depleting all, all that I was feeling good. The last, I don't know, couple hours is slowly de- depleting out of me. It's because you had to do radio with me and you're like, ah, <laughs> oh, this energy suck again. All he does is talk. Just shut him up. No, listen. That's the, listen. Ch- that's the yeah. chat, my internal monologue. My There's parents. something going on here. I You need to be on the show. I enjoy you here. <laughs> UFC 281 was last night. Good show. Yes, it was. Yeah. What did you think of that main event? Oh, um, I had it even heading into the final round. Shout out to everybody who watched us on our last combat culture show. Be calling the fights on Andrew's network over at Matt Men starting uh, UFC 282. Yes. But um, Alex Pahea becoming the UFC middleweight champion, earned that title, stopped Israel Adesanya for the second time, has defeated him three times, twice in kickboxing, once in MMA. When you're walking into your eighth, ninth professional fight, as a mixed martial artist, you're doing it in Madison Square Garden against a guy who has been unstoppable in a weight class, and you walk out with the win. That's iconic. That's legendary. That's Andrew. That's Andy Ruiz knocking out Anthony Joshua in Madison Square Garden. It's Spike Dudley uh, <laughs> winning in ECW. We were listening <laughs> the music before the break just reminded me of that. Um, but it was a great card. Five stoppages all in the main card. We didn't go to the scorecards once, uh, if I'm recalling correctly. It was a very long night uh, inside Madison Square Garden, but a great night. Zhang Wei Li ended up winning the UFC strawweight title from Carla Esparza. A really awesome card and some really great fights. If you've got ESPN Plus, I'd say give it a watch, but... A big, the biggest card of the year for the UFC. The biggest highlight of some of the best names. You had Michael Chandler and Dustin Poirier uh, at one fifty-five, and Poirier looking crisp. That was a war with Michael Chandler, and the way he got the submission, it's an instant classic highlight. Frankie Edgar retiring inside the octagon. He fell on his sword and got cooked in front of everybody inside MSG last night. But it's an interesting parallel, Andrew, to AEW and WWE. Because over the past few years, uh, the UFC has gone under a complete overhaul over time with the purchase from WME, pardon me, the <laughs> IM, you know, IMG Endeavor, uh, and just completely turning it into a different company over time with Dana White still in charge. I think we're seeing that with AEW and WWE as some of these older stars or the last generation of stars at each company start to change over, retire, start to fall off or falter, lose a little bit of their shine. A lot of other guys have to step up, and in the UFC, we haven't seen a lot of it. We haven't seen a lot of crossover stars. Adesanya was one of the few that broke through during the WME era that weren't a part of the Zufa era. 
So it's going to be, it's interesting how all three of these organizations have to build new stars and there's been success and a lot of failure in the UFC and WWE in building stars. AEW Why do you think that still is? Needs to get... I, I, like, WWE, uh, we understand, right? WWE, WWE actually has it easier to create a star. With UFC, you know, you could create a star for the next three weeks and, and all of a sudden, or three months or whatever, three years, and all of a sudden, you, your fighter that you invested all that money in and making into a big star is kind of falling apart, you know? So is that why the longevity doesn't exist as much? Well, yeah. Look at a guy like Anthony Rumble Johnson, who passed away sadly at 38 today. Yeah, unbelievable. Uh, condolences to him and his, uh, obviously, his family, friends, and uh, colleagues in the sport. Terrible to lose anybody, especially at a young age, not even 40. Um, those guys had unprecedented exposure. The sport was rising, and you had major names, and things were just hitting within the zeitgeist. I think with generational changes, UFC's audience was young, but it's starting to skew older because our generation, the sport's 29 years old now. Last night was the 29th anniversary of the first UFC event. And just there aren't a lot of fighters who are making that crossover who are getting in younger fighters. Jake Paul and Logan Paul have been doing that for boxing and now for WWE. The amount of crossover fighters aren't really there because a lot of these guys aren't social savvy. A lot of these guys are just fighters. They're just training. Not like a Paige Van Zandt who has been able to commoditize her look, her personality, everything about her into one of the biggest presences in the space. But it's not because of her ability inside the cage. She's certainly tough. She's broken her arm inside the cage. She's fought bare knuckle. I'm not screwing around with Paige Van Zandt. She's a dangerous human being. But she didn't. She got her notoriety by doing stuff outside the cage. Not a lot of UFC fighters have that level of charisma or crossover appeal. You know, the best fighter in the game up until the last few years was Khabib Nurmagomedov, and he got over because he was a smashing machine. He was yeah, a murder and man. He just, and he's gone. Yeah. He and said, it's going to be hard because, you know, they've done a lot of the th a lot of things like what ESPN, no burgeoning personalities. You are selling the name on the marquee is UFC. It is not. Like in boxing, Joshua Ruiz or Wilder uh, Fury. It is UFC, number here, then the byline is the name of the fighters. And the UFC doesn't have the incentive to push fighters as hard as they do any, as they did because they got guaranteed money coming in from ESPN+. Plus. They really don't have to lift a finger all that much in terms of promotion. They try to stack some card for the end of the year or for International Fight Week in July, but the sport is stuck in a bit of neutral right now, and Bellator, PFL, one fighting championship, which is based out of Asia, aren't hitting the notes and hitting the pockets to get a crossover audience. It's a lot of the things that we deride pro wrestling with. You know, the, the casual fan, the crossover fan, it's not there, and also there's too much content. Yeah. Every week there's a, lot, a card it's on a ESPN lot of or ESPN+. It's a lot Plus. of UFC. Yeah. And, and that's part of the problem, where... Like, I know fight nights are every every Saturday. Do I watch every Saturday? No, because it's not it's to me, it's not that big of a deal. I watch the pay-per-views, but I'm not I'm not committed to the fight fight nights. You think a lot of that exists with wrestling too? Where people are not watching. I, I'm curious about the percentage because I know for UFC it's 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 a very high percentage where you follow the pay-per-views and that's all you follow, and that's all you know about the fighters. You know nothing about the fight nights, you don't follow through about anything else that they're doing, only the big shows. How much of that in wrestling exists? I'm, I'm curious about that, especially for <sighs> WWE. Well, it's it's different because you're following the week-to-week -week narratives in wrestling. You're not doing that in MMA. These guys are fighting maybe f at most five times. There are people who fight five times a year. But if you're seeing a big name like an Israel Adesanya or anybody else in the sport, like you, you, the, the headliner of the next pay-per-view is Yiri Projaska and Glover Teixeira. That is a great fight. The first time those two guys fought, it was an epic fight. It was an epic fight on a great card. But how many people out there are going to spend $75 to watch Glover Teixeira, who's in his early 40s, and Yuri Projaska, who is a great fighter, has a marketable look, but... A lot of guys in Middle America may not want to watch a guy named Yidi Projaska. I don't think I don't think I don't think they know what a Yidi Proj Projaska is. A lot of people. I and listen. 
I'm on the East Coast. I could barely say the name. No, I agree with you. I think, listen, the fighting, the, the quality, the quality of the fights have gone up. It's just the marketing behind it has kind of gone stagnant a little. Listen, they had a great show last night. Uh, you know, sold out the garden. 18, 9, 9 19,000 people in that building. That was not a cheap ticket. Very expensive ticket to go to that show. I know a lot of people that were there, uh, and they said it was an amazing show. I, was, I, I I think that exists. You know, somebody messaged me while I while I presented that question of how many people watch wrestling casually during only for pay per views. You know what? You know what they responded with? What's that? NXT. NXT was that for a lot of people. You'd yeah. watch the specials. You really wouldn't watch the TV. I, I was in that boat for a very long time up until around 2019, 2020, where they made the move to NXT on USA because it's appointment programming. When you're watching something on Peacock or then on the WWE Network, you're like, I'll get to it later. I'll get to it later. You can't really do that with sports. You can't really do that with fights because you're going to get spoiled. And once all the things happen, and I think that's one of the reasons why Rampage is, is a little hurt because they tape some of them on Wednesdays, and it airs on a really tough spot on Friday nights at 10 p.m. when the demographic you're going for is not is most likely not door. home. Yeah. No, and, they're not home. And wrestling isn't DVR programming. Like, we, we can break down the live in ratings. There's live same day. There's live plus three. There's live plus seven. But the most important one's live, live same day because... How often, and I want to ask the chat this, how often are you watching a full episode of wrestling television, whether it's Raw, Dynamite, SmackDown, NXT, you know, Catalyst Wrestling on Fight Network, Thanks. or even Rampage, how lo are you watching that the same night? Are you watching it and catching up? Are you watching it the next day over breakfast? Like, there's, I feel like Rampage would be better set to be on Saturdays at 6 o'clock. You know, but what, what kind of rating would that draw? Will that do a half a million? Well, they're pulling in a 434 now, so it would at least yeah. overperform. Will it? That's, my, that's my question. Will I, it overperform? Well, you have, if you have it at 6 o'clock and Turner has the NBA package, having that for All-Star Saturday night, doing an All-Star Saturday night special in conjunction with Turner, there's so many crossover opportunities that we haven't seen, that they haven't been able to unlock or get into, and I think that there's a lot there that they just really haven't tapped into. And I think being on Fridays is a pain point for them. Listen, it's a pain point for me. You know, my, my, my <laughs> wrestling habits, my watching habits are all over the place. I tend to watch Rampage, uh, Dynamite live most weeks. 95% of the time I'm watching it live because I, I, I have, normally I would do a show on Thursday. Now we do it on Friday, but I got in the habit of having to watch it live. So it's fresh in my mind on Thursday morning. But Raw, I'll watch Tuesday. SmackDown, uh, you know, if I'm home, I'll have it on. But if not, most of the time I'm not home on a Friday night. I'll watch it, you know, Sunday morning or Saturday morning. And, and you know, it's a good show. But to me, you kind of, you do lose something when you're not watching it live. You do yeah, lose something. It... I have a bunch of questions for you, actually, about a Rampage and what they could do after the break. Wrestling Observer Live Sunday Edition. Join us after this break here on Sports Byline. Stay tuned. Wrestling Observer Live Sunday edition here. Joined by Matt Ryan of Catalyst Hello. Wrestling. Indeed. <sighs> we got a War Games pay-per-view in a couple weeks. I know, and I'm so excited. <laughs> I know, right? Why? Isn't it fun? It's, it's Survivor Series. It, I'm it's always the excited. the fusion dance I've wanted since I was a small boy. Ever since they, the, the concept of War Games and the concept of Survivor Series was explained to me on my television, I was like, this should be a thing. For 21 years, we could have had... Imagine if Survivor Series 2001 ended with a War Games instead of the winner-take-all match. That would have been a fun little butterfly effect. That could have been a fun little piece of history. Um, and utilizing the property, they just spent several million dollars on. Um, <laughs> it would have been great, but now Triple H really utilizing the IPs that he has access to. And I'm excited because I want to see how they're going to do war games on this level. We saw what happened with NXT, and whether or not you like the new, the newer war games in comparison to what we grew up with, the fact that the cage really didn't have a roof on it, 
a lot of plunder, a lot of tomfoolery. Um, they were effective, and they got over with that audience. It's going to be interesting to see how they modify it for the main roster, how they utilize the personalities that are going to be in those matches, and what things do they take from the NXT ones? Are they going to do like what they did with the fight pit and just make some aesthetic changes, or are they going to go a little more traditionalist to the war games we saw? And also, this is going to be the first time I think in history that a WWE, PLE, pay-per-view, what have you, will have multiple rings, a main roster. No, this PLE. is the first time. This has to be the first time. They've never done a double yeah. ring rumble. Oh, no. Maybe they'll do that next. What was that well, terrible that was the WCW? Houston Battle Royal rules. Yeah, the but what was the WCW version? What do they call it? World War Three. World War Three. There you go. I don't know. I, I, I'm I'm hoping this goes over well. Listen, you, you have the IP. How are you not capitalizing that with marketing, right? Like, you have this really cool cage concept that kids would love. I How remember. Toys listen, I had that WWF sell? rank. I had that WWF rank. The fact that it came with the steel cage, you know? I was like, wow, that's awesome. I could build a steel cage. I used to build, like, a little War Games thing and put it on the top. I You oh, know, yeah. for me... I think it's I think it's a really fun thing to see now whether or not it's going to execute great. That's that's the question here, right? This is the first time they're doing this match on a main roster television show. Uh, less room for error for them than NXT, and uh, these matches look pretty good. So it looks like the men's so far. It looks like they're building to two, right? This is it. Yeah, on they, the women's they announced, side, when they announced it, they were going to do two. Yeah, on the women's side, you have Damage Control, Nikki Cross. And to be determined versus Bianca, Asuka, Alexa, and two other TBDs. I feel like Candice LeRae ends up in there one way or another um, because of her involvement in the women's war games in NXT. Um, it'll be interesting to see how those fill out. I think that's going to be a lot of great personalities and a lot of great moments. If you remember EO Sky's garbage can moment uh, from war games a couple of years ago. That resonates a lot with fans, and I have to say, the stuff they've been doing at Damage Control, they've sold them as a top act. Definitely, it doesn't have. feel forced. It yeah. doesn't feel forced. It doesn't feel wonky. It doesn't feel like those component parts shouldn't work together. If you were telling me on paper, I'd be like, "That's a little bit of a weird choice," but it's a peanut butter and chocolate situation where it's like, "Oh, this is great together." This yeah, because they're booked sense. strong. They're booked strong. Yeah. They won the title twice already. They're booked strong. And, and you know, they, I, I to me, I, I think having them together and doing this War Games match, it's going to work. Now, for the men's side, you got the Bloodline versus the Brawling Brutes with Drew McIntyre and, and uh, Turnbuckle Al. So who do you think that, that that last guy is in here? I don't know. Um, I It could be Kevin St Kevin Owens. Kevin Owens Kevin coming back Owens. could be. It yeah. could, I think that would make a lot of sense because of the tie-in with Sami Zayn. He is a brawling He's, brute. Yes, he certainly is. But is he? A, He's on SmackDown technically, right? Yeah. Or does the, are we in whose line territory? With the I don't know. Uh, you know, they. I was told when when they when they months ago. I was told the 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 line for this hard split is kind of it's loosened up. Mm. There's no hard split anymore as far as the rosters go. Yeah, you're going to have key people on certain rosters, but, you know, if you're a top act, you're going to go, you're going to hover back and forth. Yeah. Do Which makes think... a lot of sense. That's how you're going to appease both USA yeah. and, and Fox. And I think that with the potential elimination of money in the bank and a lot of... A lot of scaling back. He's on Raw, and making, by the way. He's on Raw. And, uh, th and yeah, thank you, MG, for sending that along. I was going to say that, but I went on another tangent because I love myself and hate myself all at the same time. Doesn't make sense, but I'm in the media, so it makes sense. Um, with the scaling back of Money in the Bank and the Hell in a Cell PLEs and making less gimmick match focused events... Do you think they try to find new ways to eventize things? I think the best thing for them, if they're looking to create different rosters or kind of have a set roster for each show that people can bet, and then you have these exceptions, I would eventize the draft. I, I don't know why they haven't done that. 
They, they For the last 20 years, we've seen what the NFL, the NBA, even the NHL can do with a draft. And when you're in control of literally every aspect of the product and you have the ability to run where they do the draft for the major sports leagues, whether it's the Barclays Center, formerly Radio City, like Radio City would be ideal because it's right in between Comcast and Fox headquarters. And you can actually play a lot of play up a lot of that and turn it into a whole event. You could do it over a weekend. You can even do a dedicated PLE for it, or even maybe a simulcast if everybody would play nice because there's a lot of money on the table. You know how I would do and it. I would I would, how would you draft and make it two separate occasions. One, I would have every everybody's eligible except your champions. That makes sense. Your champions are not eligible till night two of the draft. Oh night two of the draft. Your champions are now eligible. So mm. it eliminates the whole concept of why wouldn't you grab Roman Reigns first and Brock Lesnar first? Or or why wouldn't you grab your world champion first? Well, you know, if if Roman is your champion and he's not eligible on night one to be drafted, you're going to go for Brock Lesnar. Or you're going to go for, you know, somebody maybe fourth on the line to kind of make sure that your roster's full, knowing that, you know, you may lose Roman. Or you may lose Cody or whatever it is. I think if you if you take the champions out of the equation and you have them eligible at a different date and you do maybe like some sort of, you know, you got to do the lottery system, get the lottery number. I don't know. I, I think you could do something fascinating here. I think you could do something different, which, uh, you know, you we'll see. You certainly can. Yeah. Listen, they are they are in the, the mindset now where it's okay to make a, a mistake. We saw Hunter say that on that earnings call. They are willing to experiment and try new things because you don't know if it's not going to work. I could tell you 2021, when they came back, or 2022, 2022, they were experimenting with the idea if they could be clear to run an event outdoors, they would run SummerSlam outside. Yeah. You know, what? I, I couldn't have seen it happening anyway, regardless of, of restrictions were strict or not strict outside of there but i could tell you that you know if this was now and you could do an outside show why wouldn't you have some cool little outside venue five six yeah. seven thousand people do something interesting do something a little different do something less controlled and i think that's the charm of aew for for many of us the fact that it's a less controlled of an environment th those shows that they do at daily's place right not the best venue you're staring at a wall however Daly's Place. Is that what I called it? I did call yeah, it Daly's, Daly's Place. Place. Yeah, yeah, I was right. Uh, but it looks different enough. Arthur Ashe Stadium. Is it the best stadium to be in? Absolutely not. But however, you know what? It's a different setup. It looks different. It feels different. Big time energy in that room. Those things go a very long way. They just yeah, got to experiment no, I, more. I completely agree. And I think that the WWE have the cachet and the latitude now to take more risks, to do things differently. Um, I would really root for them to run a baseball stadium up here in, in New York because those Yankee Stadium and Shea Stadium shows held such importance to the market. And the fact that no major wrestling company has run in either of those stadiums is so quixotic to me. I, 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 get, or, a, I get a little ping every time City Field is mentioned for anything. Yeah. In that company. And, and it would I've be had a great. It, I've only heard it once. I only heard City Field mentioned one time for any kind of event. Mm. Well, what, what, what was it, man? I'll tell you off the air. Okay. Didn't happen. Well, that, Didn't happen. I yeah. think I spoke about it before. Didn't happen a couple but, of years ago. They ran in New York, didn't they? Why not do a stadium series where you're doing these. Wrigley Field, Fenway Park, and you're able to work with the ballparks because it's on off days instead of having a further or need, a Grateful Dead. But you can't concert. run. You cannot run s uh, baseball season. That's the problem because you need at least for WWE. You know, well, you need yeah, at least but if five you run to these smaller eight shows, days, nine days. If you run these smaller scale shows where it's not the over the top stuff and it's about ambiance and presentation and showing off the space. I know that's not what the WWE does, but if an AEW picked up on that, if AEW if WWE does that, you're gonna say it looks low low, low rent. If 
if a if WWE runs a show, they're gonna have to do it in in a big scale. If AEW runs a stadium and it looks like what Ring of Honor was doing in Coney Island, or it looks like any other stadium show, I'm gonna tell you people are gonna reject it instantly. I I I think it's awesome. Like I I like baseball. Uh, I yeah. like being in there. However, um, the reality is you're not getting the best experience being in a stadium. And also MLB. They're they're very strict with their stadiums, but now that's I mean true. they're doing everything and, and anything to make money. So maybe there's a great alternative though that was brought up by MG Geek MLS stadiums, Red Bull Red Bull Stadium in Harrison, New Jersey. There's all these smaller stadiums opening up where the uh, where the Los Angeles We're, soccer team plays. I get it now. I get what you're saying. You get the ambiance yeah. of being in a yeah. large in a stadium, but you really you're not filling. It looks like there could be sixty thousand people there, but in reality you got about eighteen or nineteen twenty thousand. Yeah. I mean, also, Arthur Ashe just, is a great example of that. If you told people that you you they fit forty two thousand people in Arthur Ashe, you know, I think people would tend to it believe like it. This. And uh, we were talking about boxing and MMA before. The UFC runs these massive shows, or like when a boxing event takes place at Wembley Stadium, you're really not having over the top entrance sets. You'll have over the top entrances, but you're letting the enormity of the space, you're letting the atmosphere dictate the story. And I think we get caught up a lot in pro wrestling in the ov in the performative presentation of a show, sure. the trons and all this other stuff. Some of the greatest moments in wrestling history happened with the only real monitor being the thing that's hooked up to the stadium, and not having fifty million screens and not having yeah. all of this, not this sensory overload. It might be a great thing and also really beneficial to people like me with ADHD. But that's there you go. Uh, listen, me too. Wrestling Observer Live. We'll be right back after this break on Sports Byline. Stay tuned. Wrestling Observer Live. Final few minutes here on a Sunday. Why are you laughing, man? That's so right, baby. The Midnight the Rider Midnight is Rider. here <laughs> on Wrestling Observer. Where's that Dave Meltzer? I got problems with him about what he said about me in 88. I'm going to fight I... him in front of God and everybody. <laughs> Get my bull rope. You, you know, we brought up the Midnight Rider a couple times on our breaks, and it just so happened to work out for us. <laughs> How many Midnight Riders were there? The potato tonight in the Omni. <laughs> the potato. The loaded potato. You know what? You know what my move is going to be when I show up at Catalyst Wrestling? I'm going to have a loaded book, boot. I'm going to have Britt Baker's boot, and I'm going to load it up with the potato. That has to be the spot I do. <laughs> that, I that's just take, the you know what? That'll be my that's gimmick. I just, take, I, just take, I just take Britt Baker's boot around. I'm like, listen, I'm not really into this. I'm not into the boot stuff. I'm not. I'm just, it's just a weapon. I, I'm, it's not a weird thing. I won it at an auction. It was for kids. $800. I think it was Tuesday's children, right? Wasn't that it? Well, good, well, good, good job for do, saving it for the kids. For the then kids, you hit me in the eye with that potato, baby. I can't see, but tonight at the Greensboro, at, in Greensboro, I'm gonna come down there. It's gonna be me and Dick and Murdoch, and I'm gonna Did elbow anybody... you in the face until you cry. You pretty man, I'm gonna hit Did you heel... again. Did any heel call it the gang Greensboro? I, Lost I, opportunity there. Get, get me get me a time machine. We're going to 1975, and we're making $12 million. That's it. That, just on that promo alone. Guys, I had a blast with you guys today. I had a tremendous time with you guys. Uh, follow me on Twitter. My voice is going at this point. At Andrew Zarian. Uh, hey, little news here. If you have not subscribed to the Mattman channel, do so for us. Mattman Podcast yes. here on YouTube. We're Mattman Podcast everywhere. Podcasts are available. And also... Matt Ryan is starting off. He is yeah. now an official Matt man or Matt boy. Yay. He's going to be doing UFC coverage boy. live for the pay-per-views. Matt, quickly, where can people follow you? You can follow me on Twitter at Matt Ryan. You can follow me at Catalyst Wrestling. Go to streamcatalystwrestling.com or go to bellhouseny.com and buy tickets to our Catalyst Wrestling show January 22nd. Rock the Bell House. And that's it, guys. We'll see you all next time on Wrestling Observer Live.